So this morning we have a very special speaker. Uh, her name is Dune McCall, and she's with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Authority and is responsible for uh, Great Barrier Reef Stewardship Councils. Um, she is a fellow of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, which is a very prestigious uh, research fellowship uh, in Australia, and Dune's fellowship allows her to investigate uh, North American voluntary environmental programs to inform uh, the Great Barrier Reef stewardship models. Uh, she'll study various groups in the United States and Canada, and during her fellowship, um, she'll be looking at uh, the Cities Initiative. I'm Nicola Crawhall. I'm the Deputy Director of the Cities Initiative, and that means that my name appears on the website, Nicola Crawhall, Deputy Director. Here's my, uh, here's my email. And the power of the internet is that when Dune was sitting at her computer on the other side of the planet, she said, well, you know, where are these stewardship alliances that I should be studying, particularly related to water, and came across our organization, sent me an email and said, uh, can I come and study you? And I thought, how delightful. <laughs> um, I don't know what we have in common, but, uh, you know, let's, let's see what we can talk about. And no sooner than we had got together that she and I started uh, jabbering, basically, about the kind of work we do. And it, it occurred to me very quickly that even though we are on uh, the uh, opposite sides of the globe, that we're working on very similar issues related to water quality that is affected by so many different uh, little sources, uh, and that we actually approach it pretty much the same way, uh, which is collaboratively. Because there are so many small sources, you've got to work with municipalities, with farmers, with other stakeholders to figure out uh, how everybody can contribute to the solution. Uh, so we are, even though we are on opposite sides of the planet, uh, and we are working in very local circumstances that are very different, uh, I think we have a lot to learn from each other, and so I thank Dune for reaching out and recognizing that uh, even though environmental issues are very local, uh, learning and uh, sharing experiences can be uh, quite international. So uh, welcome, Dune McCall. Thanks, everybody. I'm so delighted to be here today as your sister in the great family of the Great Lakes and the Great Barrier Reef. You have the largest freshwater lake system in the world. We've got the largest coral reef ecosystem. So I think we're practically related. In the very short time I've been here, I've come to the conclusion that we don't just share global icons. We also share these complex, multi-jurisdictional environmental problems. Problems like climate change, declining water quality and invasive pest species. These impacts can really seem insurmountable at times and it's easy to feel a bit disheartened. So I'm concentrating not on a doom and gloom presentation, as you can see from the slideshow, I am concentrating on the positives and what we can achieve by working collaboratively with our communities. First, for some context, I'd like to talk to you about the Great Barrier Reef. Secondly, I'd like to share with you about how we work with local councils or local government. And finally, I'm going to ask you to help me with my Churchill Fellowship. Because, uh, as Nicola said, uh, I work for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, but I'm actually on leave for three, week, three months. So I'm not representing them. I'm here as a Churchill Fellow. Um, uh, that said, uh, once I get back to my day job, I really hope that we can continue the conversation that we're starting this week. So, the Great Barrier Reef truly is one of the great natural wonders of the world. It's a vast and spectacular natural system. It's not just coral reefs, though. It's a complex mosaic of habitats, of mangroves, seagrass beds, the coral reefs, and deep sea habitats. Biologically, it's one of the most diverse places on Earth. And it's a very dynamic ecosystem. We know that over centuries it's changed and it's going to continue to change as, as environmental conditions change. Uh, for context, it's about half the size of Texas and stretches for 2,300 kilometres along the northeastern coast of Australia. Of course, I believe I live in the most beautiful part, that's Cairns. I've been there, it's in the far north area. I've been there for over 30 years and I'm still... Um, finding it breathtaking. The Great Barrier Reef was protected as a marine park in the 1970s, and in the 1980s, it became Australia's first World Heritage Area. It's a multiple-use park, and that means that tourism, commercial and recreational fishing, boat and uh, boating, 
uh, all those uses are completely legitimate. These days, the reef contributes about uh, $5.6 billion to the Australian economy, and most of that's through tourism. There are about a million people living in our catchment, so much smaller than the Great Lakes, I, I confess. Um, but our communities and industries really rely on a healthy reef. And in many ways, the reef really defines our economies, our livelihoods and our culture. And it's also a major part of the national identity of Australians. The park is managed by my organisation, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. We had our 40th birthday last year, so we're, we're pretty old. Uh, and we have our own Act of Parliament that tells us what we need to do to protect the park. Uh, we've got about 200 staff and they're a very dedicated and passionate crew. We directly management, manage activities within the park and we write a lot of policies and plans about reef use and protection. Uh, but the causes of the impacts to the reef um, unfortunately lie outside the park's boundary and um, outside our legislative control. And just to recap, the greatest threat to the reef is climate change, and it's manifesting in a couple of different ways, through ocean acidification, through mass coral bleaching events that we've had earlier this year. And I've, I've included some pictures of um, bleached coral in the slides, and you can see that they're quite eerily beautiful. Uh, and we're also seeing an increase in severe weather events. That's our tropical cyclones. Declining water quality is the next biggest issue. And in my region, which is very tropical, the main impacts are coming from sugarcane and banana crops. We get about two to three metres of rain a year. And you can imagine that with those kinds of rainfall events, we get a lot of sediment and nutrient running off farms and out onto the Great Barrier Reef. It's very unhealthy for our, all our habitats. Um, but also the latest research seems to be suggesting there may be some linkages also with outbreaks of the crown of thorn starfish. It's a very prickly looking critter that I've put on the slideshow as well. Um, and they, um, they're a naturally occurring species on the reef, but their uh, populations are going through a current, an explosion at the moment and they love eating coral. So um, they can really decimate our reefs. We've been doing a lot of work over the last 10 years, uh, improving best management practices for our banana and cane farmers. But the latest studies suggest that won't be enough to just stop the declines in water quality that we're seeing and really reverse those declines. And the latest studies and technical working groups are suggesting that we really need to be looking at transformative change. We can't wait um, to do um, a decade of studies and, and worry about implementation. They're sort of saying we need to get in there pretty fast and repair our coastal ecosystems because those wetlands can slow down the force of water going out to the reef, reef and filter the, um, the, the sediment and the nutrients from the water. From a local government perspective, the key water quality impacts are stormwater and urban water quality. You know, I spend a bit of time writing uh, letters of support for councils that want to upgrade their sewerage systems, and luckily we've, we've had some success in that lately. And of course, local government plays a major role in land use planning and development conditions when they approve applications along the coast. I mentioned earlier, we don't have the legislative powers on land to address water quality issues, um, but it's clear we can't sit on our hands and do nothing. We've had to act and we've met these challenges by working with our communities and industries. And one of the key tools that we use is something called the Reef Guardian Stewardship Program. It aims to link communities to the reef um, and build awareness that the, what happens on land is inextricably linked to what happens on water on the reef. Um, it's also about changing practices that will endure and transfer across generations. And it's also about empowering people to act locally to help the Great Barrier Reef because there's an enormous swell of support to do that. The Reef Guardian program began over 12 years ago with Reef Guardian schools and so far we've got over 300 schools and over 120,000 students uh, involved in the program. We also have programs for commercial fishers and farmers. And we've taken a different approach there. We've really chosen industry champions who are going to encourage the uptake of best practices with their peers. Uh, because we do find people don't always trust experts or scientists or people from the government, but they do um, respect and listen to their peers. 
But my true passion in the Reef Guardian Stable is the Reef Guardian Council program. That's the program I manage across, um, across the state. We have 16 councils, so much smaller than your, your group today. There are um, a powerful bunch of people. They're all the coastal councils and a few extras. And they make up about 70% of the reef catchment. And for comparison, the reef catchment is about the size of California. Uh, it's the area that our, my councils covers about 300,000 square kilometres. And the, the councils are really different in their size, their population lev levels, their industries, their budgets, and the issues they deal with. Um, they contrast up the north, we have Cookshire Council. Um, they're, they're responsible for an area covering really vast cattle properties and also a lot of uh, Aboriginal communities that are still living a relatively traditional lifestyle. In other areas, we've got really intensively developed areas with, um, with big industrial ports. But we don't mind whether Reef Guardian councils are big or small. Uh, what we do is work with the councils on a program of continuous improvement to help the Great Barrier Reef. And we do this um, through an annual, each council prepares an annual action plan and hopefully they're very busily finishing off their plans for the next, next financial year as I speak. Um, and they, they report on what activities they're going to do in the next year on a number of different headings, land management, water management, waste management, community education and climate change. Some examples of the climate change uh, activities that they'll undertake are usually fairly low-hanging fruit like um, improving energy efficiencies within councils, that's a, a, a big money saver for them, uh, and putting solar panels on community infrastructure. In general, the actions in the annual plan can vary greatly. It might be including a biodiversity layer in their planning schemes or um, repairing um, a pipeline under a, a causeway that will help connect the salt water uh, to the fresh water so that fish can go up and breed in the fresh water. Uh, the action plan framework was developed by councils for councils in collaboration with us. Um, and we can, it continues to evolve. Um, in, it with, in a partnership approach. Uh, our role is we convene meetings of the steering committee and the working group several times a year. And that's a good opportunity for us to get together and share projects and ideas and, and, and share, share what we're up to, I guess. Um, one example is last year we got some extra money for um, marine debris and the councils have been an absolutely key partner in implementing that through um, um, reef-wide community cleanups, marine debris art projects on their foreshores, and um, we've just finished a whole round of source reduction workshops along the coast that our councils um, hosted. And on that issue, I think um, while councils deal directly with some of those water quality issues, the, the biggest thing I think they bring to us is the enormous capacity to influence what their residents um, think and do. Um, um, and as the threats to the reef increase, it's clear we need everybody to do much more. We must build on our existing stewardship foundation and take the next st steps. And we need to really build a more robust and powerful reef guardian network. Um, and I was very lucky to receive this Churchill Fellowship last year. It was established 50 years ago to give Australians an opportunity to travel overseas to research an issue they're passionate about and that will benefit the Australian community. This is the beginning of three months I've got in North America where I'll be visiting other stewardship and collaborative approaches, um, visiting community groups, industry groups and other government agencies. Uh, so I hope over the next day and a half, if you've got a spare 10 minutes, you'll look for me and describe for me your experience in being part of the city's initiative and what you're doing in your own council areas. The benefits, the costs, the success stories and the challenges ahead. I've got next week in Toronto and the following week in Chicago and I would love to travel to your council areas and see the work that you're doing on the ground. Um, and on that note, I hope the slideshow has inspired you to include the Great Barrier Reef on your bucket lists um, and come and visit me in Australia. I am family, after all. And also, I've got a great idea. Perhaps we need to hold a Cities Initiative annual meeting there. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody, and thanks so much to my hosts.